All right, everybody. It is Steve, the Rogue Scholar, and sorry about a little bit of a delay. It's we were able to pull this thing off within twelve hours, and really appreciative of uh, Professor Keen's willingness to jump on on short notice. This uh, f failing, if you will, of the uh, Silicon Valley Bank is a microcosm, if you will, of a larger problem. We're going to talk about those and. Uh, Without further ado, let me bring on my guest, Mr. Steve Keen. Welcome to the show, sir. Good day, Matt. Sorry about the uh, delay. Everybody's explanation. I've I didn't realize there'd be, there's now a five hour time difference, rather a four hour time difference. I thought there was five, and I was rushing back from another podcast, the Debunking Economics Podcast, on a train sixty kilometers from London. So a bit of a rush to get here. I appreciate you doing it, sir. I appreciate mm. you doing it. Look, this is uh, you know. This subject in and of itself is bi much bigger than this one instance. This one oh, yeah. instance right here, it's kind of like cracking the seal on a tomb of information that people have forgotten, they don't talk about, et cetera. And I think that, you know, just from my point of view, knowing that the Federal Reserve has jacked up interest rates and the uh -huh. banks and and throughout the um through the entire economy. They have not been prepared for these hikes. These hikes, you know, really impacted society very differently than I think people expected. I mean, they raised interest rates with the intention of cooling off inflation, which is simultaneously a redistribution of money upward to people that already have money. But mm -hmm. that also puts pressure on all these banks to adjust to the interest payments that are coming out as well. And in particular with the um, Silicon Valley Bank, this is not your standard bank. FDIC insures up to $250,000 deposits. These guys, it was significantly, significantly higher than that. And, uh, you know, the initial thought was that they were just going to allow it to crash and burn. That was Yellen's uh, kind of commentary. And I think they realized that if they allowed that to happen, there was going to be a lot more dominoes to fall um, that would maybe create some consequences they weren't prepared for. So with that, Steve, you are my expert. I'm not. I'm just regurgitating. I read your article. It mm -hmm. was. I first of all, I want to appreciate the fact that you literally pointed out Macro Elf, Michael Hudson, every like everybody, like like just about everybody's perspectives um, on this, and then you provided your own. And so I'm curious. Tell us, I guess, what is going on first of all, just with the micro slice of the. Silicon Valley Bank. What what mm. caused this? What what is this all about? And then we'll go into what has happened since. Yeah, I mean that, that's that's where I, I had to say that uh, Alf and uh, Francis and Michael, uh, to some degree, uh, know more about the actual technicalities of the banking uh, system than I do in the United States, uh, and also they know about what's actually going on behind SVB. So both Alf and, uh, and uh, Francis would say quite cynical about the risk management practices as SVB and, and, um, and potential, you know, is there fraud, is there misconduct, that sort of thing, where you can actually point the finger at the individual bank. Or what my perspective was is that when you raise interest rate, you drop bond values. Banks, uh, ever since the Glass-Siegel Act, uh, when they separated banks from uh, uh, from uh, uh, you know, commercial banks from um, the speculative uh, end of the banking sector, the merchant banks. Uh, banks are primarily required to have what they call safe assets. Uh, reserves are the safest assets of all, of course, but they normally earn no income. So the one that, uh, that, that banks actually almost have a responsibility to do is to buy bonds, government bonds. So what that means is putting up interest rates, which is supposed to control inflation, and that's the factor that the mainstream economists who run the Federal Reserve focus upon. They really don't understand the banking sector. They seem to ignore that as they push up interest rates, they push down the value of the assets, a major component of the assets of the banking sector. And that's what happened here, falling value worth of bonds. And they fall dramatically when you're starting from bonds, which you know were having face yields of one quarter of 1%. As you increase the interest rate, you dramatically drop the value of the bonds. That means the assets of the banking sector fall. And one thing banks must maintain uh, in opposition to what the rest of us can do, they must have positive equity. So their financial assets must be greater than their financial liabilities. And uh, for for the SVB, because it had so many government bonds on its books, that wasn't the case. 
And that's what led the, 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 the panic. And in this case, it really you can blame the Federal Reserve for the failure of SVB. Yeah, it's just interesting to me because obviously the, the concept of bailing out banks is very distasteful. Most of us have watched as our lives have fallen into the toilet. And so there's a bit mm -hmm. of a rightful edge to us that doesn't want to see these banks bailed out when we have not been bailed out ourselves. Yeah. Um, but within that, there, there's a much larger thing at play. I've seen folks such as Robert Hockett and even guys like Ron Gray who are saying, hey, listen, you know, we want to insure deposits. We, we want to insure yeah. that these things. This is not something we want to celebrate watching collapse. What we want to do is we want to force banks to actually do the proper risk management, to ensure the proper uh, tools are in place to prevent collapse such as happened here and everything they've done quite frankly from their lobbyists throughout have been to in fact block any form of regulatory support any form of legislation that would um, in fact keep them kind of smart and in between the lines they they like that wild wild west feeling it's kind of got that whole uh, shadow bank element to it i'm curious what do you see based on your understanding of the banking system as a whole what do you see that is the primary thing that has caused these banks and and there's more there's more that are going to happen it's just a question of what treasury and fed and others will do uh, once they happen but what, what do you think is the primary cause of these collapses oh it's the one that michael hudson identified in his argument and that is qa quantitative easing uh, that's that's led to this situation because uh, and for QE was the was the Federal Reserve's response to the financial crisis it didn't see coming back in two thousand and seven, and what it thought it could do is by uh, they, they what 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 has actually involved this Fed in, in, under quantitative easing the Federal Reserve bought bonds off banks and non bank financial institutions. When you buy the bonds, you drive up the prices of the bonds, and that's deliberate, and you drive down the interest rate as a result. So their belief was, and you can find Bernanke saying this, I say Bernanke won the stupid prize in economics last year. Uh, that's what you get the Nobel <laughs> Prize for being something you think which is stupid, but, it, but agreed to by neoclassical economists. So his stupid model uh, of banking is that banks are intermediaries. Banks enable, you know, Grumbine to lend to Keane, and when Grumbine lends to Keane, Grumbine's spending power goes down, Keane's goes up. When Keen repays, Keen spending power goes down, Grumbine's goes up. Nothing really changes at the aggregate level. That's the way they think about banking. Completely wrong because banks originate. Banks create debt and create money. Uh, if I borrow money from a bank, you, it has no effect on your deposit. If you even deposit at the same bank, they're not lending out your deposit to me. They're creating an asset for themselves, which is the loan, and creating a liability for themselves, which is the deposit. That's how banks actually operate. Now, uh, by, by ignoring the level of private debt, uh, because they think it's a you know an act between consenting adults, so they don't think it has any effect on the overall economy. We've ballooned from levels of private debt back in the 1960s of the order of 60 and 70 percent of GDP to, in America's case, 170 percent. Quite up around the world, debt levels are 200 percent of GDP. That's what they should have been focusing upon. They ignored all that. They therefore didn't see the financial crisis coming when it hit they thought that they would boost the capacity of banks to lend, not realizing that bank lending has actually caused the problem. Uh, they So what they thought was that they buy bonds. When they buy bonds, they therefore give uh, the banks extra reserves. And they quite seriously think banks lend out reserves. Now, that is garbage. <laughs> that is childish. That is somebody who's never done accounting to work out what the actual dynamics are. Banks do not lend reserves. The only way they can lend reserves is if all loans are in cash, okay, uh, which which is not not the real world. So they have a completely false model, but they thought by giving banks less bonds and more reserves, they'd lend more reserves, and that would kickstart the economy. Now, too much private debt actually caused the problem. It's the wrong thing to begin with. But when they did QE, uh, by giving banks these excess reserves, the lending they thought would happen wouldn't happen. But what actually happened was when they bought those bonds off non-banks, non-banks were allowed to buy shares. So they dived into the share market, into property and so on. That's what gave us the asset price bubble. And with that asset price bubble, we had overvalued shares and, because of QE, overvalued bonds. Now, for banks, what that meant was the major asset they have on their, the two major asset reserves, which they can't, which were used for interbank operations and for the link with the government, they've got no role in lending, reserves, loans and bonds. 
They can't get many more loans out the road because we're all sick of borrowing fundamentally. Loans are pretty much sort of flatlined for the last 15 years as a percentage of GDP. But bonds, bond holdings went up. And then, therefore, when they tried to reverse QE because of the fear of inflation, they put the interest rate up and that drives bond values down. What that means is banks must maintain positive equity. Assets must be greater than liabilities. Plunging value of bonds means their assets are going to be below the value of liabilities. And once your assets, are, once your liability exceeds your assets, bank, you are bankrupt. And that's what they were pushing SVB towards. Some speculators saw that and got their money out in a hurry, the Peter Thiels of the world. Uh, but the fundamental cause was the Federal Reserve not knowing what the effort's doing uh, and making a, making another mistake on top of the original mistake and therefore effectively bankrupting or breaching this, the, the, uh, the uh, stability of the financial sector when their primary role is to maintain the stability of the payment system. <laughs> well, I want to show you this, and unfortunately, it doesn't show up quite as nicely as I would like it to, but I'll just read this. It's from Newswire, and it's sitting there, and this is a couple hours ago, uh, 9.49 uh, a.m. <clears throat> Eastern Time. He says, First Whoa. Republic Bank down 66%. Western Alliance Bancor down 75%. Pac West Bancor down 46%. Uh, Zions Bancor 44%. Hawaii, Bank of Hawaii down 42%. Customer Bancor down 54%. East West Bancor down 32%. Comerica down 39%. And I mean, and there's even more. I mean, it's 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 ridiculous yeah. how insane it is. It, this, this is just the tip of the iceberg, is it not? It is because banks are necessarily levered institutions. They have uh, they create money by lending. So they start off by having positive equity, uh, which means they've got they've got assets which would fundamentally reserves or bonds, which they start with, and no liabilities. When you you start a bank, you haven't got any deposits, so you don't have any liabilities, and their equity is therefore equal to their current assets. Now they they operate by uh, creating loans, so they give a, a borrower a loan that creates an ad additional asset for the bank and a matching liability, and that pushes up the level of both assets and liabilities relative to equity. And they only make money if they have, you know, a, a large level of loans, say ten times the value of their of their ten or twenty times the value of their equity, and that multiplied by a small rate of interest gives them a large rate of return. So they they operate on leverage, and but therefore. They're very fragile to decline in asset values because liabilities tend to remain constant. Uh, you know, they're, they're not uh, as variable. Uh, they, your liabilities don't change radically. Your assets can plunge. And if your assets are, are shares, that was normally the fragility. That's what caused the Great Depression uh, in the sense that banks own shares. Share values plunged. The banks were bankrupt. After the, after the Great Depression, they said, well, you've got to have merchant banks are separate from uh, uh, from retail banks. Retail banks cannot speculate on the share market. Why don't you buy nice stable bonds? But what we'd be by driving the interest rate down as low as the Federal Reserve did, that increased the volatility of bonds. And what I illustrate in my simple little uh, example from my Minsky model in my paper is that if you go from a bonds of when bonds of the interest rate is three percent and you go to five percent, you can actually you'd actually in my little very simple model, you drive the entire banking sector into negative equity and the payment system collapses. And that's the last mm. thing you want in a capitalist economy. That's you know, I definitely agree with Rohan and Kogu. It's good fun to laugh at the owners of the banks going bankrupt. You just don't want the banks to go bankrupt. Right. So I guess fundamentally, the banks themselves appear to have leveraged themselves heavily in federal bonds by buying all these bonds and I'm trying my best to put this into a space that I can appreciate and understand by mm. buying all those bonds with the additional increase in interest rates. I mean, most of these things were fixed term bonds. They weren't variable bonds or anything like that. So help me understand they already accounted for the bonds that they sold. They were already fixed. They were already set. Where does this extra volatility come from? Uh, it, it comes in from the price of the bond. Like the example I use in the in the very simple Minsky model, and I might, if you let me share the screen, I might show that to people as we talk, which would uh, make it a bit clearer. clearer. Um, so let's see if I'll just try sharing 
presentation. Okay, share screen. Okay, and boom, and then we go for this one, and I'll get this out of the way. So this is the mid. Can you see the model on screen? It's very very simple. Yep. Okay. Okay. So what I have here is a very like a, this is this are the aggregate of the banking sector, and I've, some of the numbers are based on real data. So reserves in America are about three trillion dollars right now. Uh, bonds are at the order of thirty one point five trillion dollars worth of bonds. Uh, in the aggregate of the entire, that's the actually government bonds outstanding. So this is a very simplified model. The whole idea is to focus upon what is the mechanism that caused the caused the crisis. And what you can see is they've got these are the assets. There are the liabilities just deposits. The bank's got four and a half trillion dollars worth in net equity, and they've got these loans outstanding. So interest payments are coming in from the depositors to the banks, but they've also got these bonds which are earning three percent interest. So therefore, that's the the bond interest coming in from the banks and everything's fine. If I run the system now, which I'll do, uh, the equity rises a bit because it's uh, you've got to stabilize the inflows and outflows from the banking sector to reach equilibrium there. So you're in an equilibrium system. Everything's going along very nicely. And then you put the bond rates up and bang, you plunge. But you, you wouldn't have necessarily seen that quickly, but you went below zero. <laughs> right. Okay. Now the, the, the logic I've got there for the for the bonds is that they, I've, I've modeled the bonds of what they call consoles. And consoles are bonds which never expire. Uh, that's a, the shorthand for consolidated uh, uh, debt, which is, goes back, I think, to the, to the British government during the, maybe the Napoleonic Wars, maybe earlier. Now, in a console, you buy a bond, it lasts forever. Okay. And what then? What the result is that the price is the inverse of the interest rate, uh, the interest rate divided by the uh, prevailing interest rate. So I'll go back to sharing the screen again just to show that properly. Hang on a second. Pardon me, jumping around a bit here. Now, okay. we, real quick, while you're doing the interest rate being yeah, whatever yeah. is the standard interest rate and prevailing interest rate, prevailing interest rate is the overall interest rate. Interest rate is the one that they actually yeah. purchased the bond for. Am I, is that, yeah, you, when, you understand yeah, different. You pay, if you, yeah, if you buy, if you buy a thousand dollar bond and it's paying $10, you're getting 1% interest. Okay. Okay. Now, if, if, if then prevailing interest rates rise to 2%, then that 1% is a lousy rate of return. So if you want to sell that bond, and this is where it's working in terms of consoles, rather than being able to get a price of a thousand dollars for it, somebody will buy it off you for $500. And therefore, at five hundred dollars, the one dollar is worth two percent. So, an increase in the value of the, of the bonds uh, drives up the uh, drives down the value of the bond if you want to sell it to somebody else. Now, if you don't want to sell it to somebody else, you can pretend it's still worth that much on your books. So, what banks uh, try to avoid is to actually mark the value of the bonds at the actual price they could sell them for. And this is where Alf uh, Alf. Uh, Pecorelli, uh, I can't think of how to pronounce Alf's last name, but Alf, who runs the macro, comp comp macro compass, he explains that very well. Um, so you, uh, you, you, you have several different accounts they can put their bonds into, which are fictional. So one account says, oh, we're going to hang these bonds forever and we're going to sell them. So the sale price doesn't matter. Okay. And you pretend, therefore, that even at the price so you could sell them for has gone down, you're holding them to maturity so it doesn't matter. Now, that means you hide all this sort of stuff. And that's what most other banks are doing as well right now. This particular bank, SVB, didn't do that. So what it meant was the, it, it, it took it on the jaw fundamentally when the, uh, when the asset prices plunge. And they plunge because rates are going up. And it, it's not as, not as dramatic as my model because uh, when you have a bond which expires after 30 years, then it isn't precisely inverse to the, of the relationship relationship to the interest you're earning to the prevailing interest rate. Uh, but it's pretty bad if, because because when you get rates down to like if when you're buying bonds and they were yielding half a percent, which happened at one stage during the financial during the QE period, half a percent, you go to three percent or four percent, you've trashed the value of the bond. It may have had a face value of one thousand. When you try to sell it, you may, might be lucky to get that 150 bucks. So it means wow. that bonds which used to be a very stable asset for banks and stability requires a higher interest rate okay with the lower interest rate the volatility goes through the roof and that's what's hitting the banking sector now and in some ways the federal reserve has been blinded by this because they don't have banks or debt or money in their bloody macroeconomic models 
and therefore they think they can control the rate of inflationary expectations. You know, that's what they think they're doing. Oh, gee, we sank the financial system. <laughs> Terribly sorry about that. <laughs> well, listen, let's let's take a step back for the people in the audience. Can you walk us through what quantitative easing, since this is what we're kind of laying at the foot of yeah. the problem here? I, you know, obviously I've, I, I've seen Kelton have a different take. I've had Mosler have a different take. I've had a yeah. hundred takes, literally like so many takes that it's like almost impossible to isolate mm. where the common ground is in this particular yeah. case. though, when I read Michael's uh, out of your uh, sub stack, I, you know, yeah. I said, okay, I got to figure this out because you, you obviously deal with Francis uh, Coppola and others that, you know, I don't typically work with. So help me understand first, number one, define quantitative easing and its impact on the economy. And then let's roll it back to its impact on this very scenario. Okay. Well, when the Federal Reserve sets a target interest rate, it then gets involved in what are called open market operations between itself and the and the banking sector, uh, trying to be trying to because of the inverse relationship between bond prices and interest rates, and they're trying to target a band, interest rate band, they would buy and sell bonds to try to keep the interest rate within half of, within a quarter of a percent above or below the actual target rate they'd set. Now, the target rate used to be at the order of, you know, 3%. That's the example, and 6%, 10% during under Vokla, 17% under Vokla. What I chose was the 3% rate. So what that would mean is they say the rate is going to be 3%, uh, that's that's the rate that bonds will sell for on the open market. We do our open market operations to buy and sell bonds to try to keep it within that band. Now, what that means in the aggregate, they're buying over the year could be zero. They could buy, they could sell as many bonds as they buy. Quantitative easing said we are going to be, as well as doing this operation to try to maintain the 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 interest rate around the band, the band of interest rates around the target rate we've set. As well as doing that, we promise to be on the buy side in America's case, to the tune of $80 billion per month, roughly a trillion dollars a year. They said, we're going to buy a trillion dollars more worth of bonds than we sell every year. And that's what they did under quantitative easing. And what that meant was banks uh, have, because of government deficit spending, when the government spends more than it takes back in taxes, as well as putting more money in people's bank accounts or expanding the money supply, Again, this is the opposite of what their own models tell them, but that's reality. They also put that into reserves. Now, reserves historically did not get paid any interest by the Federal Reserve. So it's the reserves, which are an asset of the banking sector, are a liability of the central bank. And just as banks used to pay us interest in our deposit accounts, it was feasible for the Federal Reserve to pay interest on reserves, but they didn't do that. Um, now, so what would happen for banks is that but because the deficit, let's say that the government did a deficit of a trillion dollars, that creates a trillion dollars in reserves earning no income. So then the government is required by law, not by any practicality, but by law, to make sure its own account of the Treasury, uh, the Treasury's account of the central bank doesn't go to negative, it doesn't go into overdraft. So the Treasury sells bonds to the private banks. And then what the private banks do, they buy those bonds using reserves. So the deficit creates a trillion dollars in reserves. The, the Federal Reserve, the, the Treasury sells a trillion dollars worth of bonds. The, 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 the banks hold the reserves go down by a trillion, holding the bonds go up by a trillion. Okay, so that's that's the, sta the starting point. Then the banks themselves sell all those bonds to non-banks. There's a huge trade, the secondary market on 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 bonds. So about ninety percent of bonds end up being owned by non-bank financial institutions, Morgan Stanley, all that that lot as well. Now under QE is they said we're going to buy a trillion dollars a year worth. They're reversing, in effect, what's being happened with the, the, the Treasury's own actions in creating a deficit. They're saying, we're going to increase your reserves and reduce your bonds by a trillion dollars a year. Okay, And what that meant was, first of all, it drove interest rates down, bond prices up, interest rates down. Uh, secondly, it meant that banks had many, many more reserves on their books than they were ever mm -hmm. used to. So if you, if you go to the Federal Reserve, the, the wonderful uh, FRED database, the St. Louis uh, Federal Reserve database called FRED, Federal, Fed, Fed, Federal Reserve Economic Data database, uh, you'll see that the level that they call excess reserves used to be virtually zero for 30, 40 years. 
Then the financial crisis hit. They start going QE. Excess reserves hit four or five trillion dollars. At the moment, excess reserves in that sense are running at about three trillion dollars. Okay. Okay. Co co so correct me if I'm wrong the here. Reserves. Do they? Yeah. Yeah. Do Do they not? Does the federal government in the United States in particular not specifically have a mandate at this time to pay interest on reserves? Yes, they do. Okay, they've started paying so interest. So we're on adding reserves, new reserves. Interest, yeah. Do those reserves yeah. generate more interest on those reserves? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Okay. Uh, but but it's a lower rate of interest than on bonds. So, like, I'm not sure what the rate on reserves right now, but if the bond rate is 3.5, most likely the reserve rate is 3.25. So, when the Treasury says, we want to sell you, you know, a couple of trillion dollars worth of bonds, and the banks say, sure. That'll go from a 3.25 rate of return to a 3.5% rate of return. And there, okay. we, 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 whereas we can't trade reserves, because reserves are, you the lucky trying to trade the bank. You can't trade your bank account, okay? Okay, bonds you can trade, I and mean, bond prices do change. So that's part of the whole market of, the, of bonds and so on. So what quantitative easing did was dramatically reduce the amount of bonds that banks have and increase the amount of reserves. And now quantitative tightening, which they're doing to try to push the interest rate up, is doing the opposite. Right. And that, that has increased the fragility of the banking sector, which is the opposite of the, of the responsibility the Federal Reserve actually has. And here's what happens when you have neoclassical economists running a real world. That's, that's the fundamental problem here. Those, they're not stupid uh, by, by birth. They weren't born stupid, but they became <laughs> stupid by doing a degree in neoclassical economics. And we put them in charge of the most volatile and important part of the economic system, the financial sector. And this is why we have fun events like this, like this crisis. So, you know, one, one final question. I, I was watching how they were talking about basic risk management dictated interest rate swaps. I'm like, what do they mean by that? And in other words, they have to cross invest in other things to have an offsetting interest rate to prevent any kind of fragility from interest rate A and bond group A to over here to having some, it, it, it's some sort of a diversification of interest bearing yeah. bonds or just debt instruments of any variety. I mean, what, help me understand what well, that it, means. It's, it's, it's fixed versus floating returns. So when we took the case of a, of a treasury bond, it has a coupon rate. So if you buy a bond for a thousand dollars and the coupon rate is 2%, it says we'll pay you 20 bucks a year. And then matter what happens in the market, whether the price goes up or down, you get 20 bucks a year. That's the fixed rate. Uh, but of course, what that that's good to get the 20 bucks a year, but the value is a thousand. Now, if rates go up to three percent, the value of the bond falls. And the fall, value the fall of the bond is far greater than what you're getting on a uh, in a uh, income flow from the interest on the bond. So the effect on your capital is much more drastic than the effect on your cash flow. So to hedge that possibility of rising rates, what you can buy is another instrument which has a floating rate so that the interest rate paid on the instrument goes up if the normal rate goes up, okay? So that, that's the sort of swap that people are getting, fix the floating interest rate swaps. But that, that, that can get rid of risk for an individual. It does not eliminate risk collectively. And this is the mistake that neoclassical make all the time. They think at the individual and don't think at the collective level. So at the collective level, the risk is still there. And what it meant was the banks that don't do this enough are the ones that are exposed to the drop in bond, bond prices when rates go up, and that's SVB. But all the rest of them are in a similar situation. So with, with an Just understanding... Heads, it'll take longer. Yeah. With an understanding that after Yellen's initial, I'm not going to do anything, to the flip-flop immediately thereafter where they're going to do something, my question to you is, yeah. number one, what exactly is it that FDIC does for something like this? If they're going to insure all deposits, I mean, these deposits, we're not talking about $250,000. We're talking about many, 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 many millions of dollars. And they're saying, it, we, mm. first of all, we know that taxes literally do not pay for or finance spending. But in the case of mm. this arrangement that we're talking about here, how they're saying it does not impact taxpayers at all. Where does that money come from that they're using to insure those deposits, if you will? 
Oh, the, the Federal Reserve, uh, and, and this is one of the few times Ben Mackey has ever made sense. Uh, when he spoke about they said the, the Federal Reserve has a printing, the technology we call a printing press, because it's not, they don't print the money, it's really making a bank entry. If they want to buy an asset off a private bank, they make an entry in the deposit account of the private bank, which is their reserves, and they make an entry on their own asset saying, we've now purchased that asset. But they don't have to pay market price. If they want to buy something, let's say you've got a bond which has got a face value of 1,000, interest rates have risen, so it's now selling the market for 500, they could say, we like here, we'll buy it for a thousand and we'll value it a thousand on our books as well. And nobody can challenge them because they're, you know, the central bank, central bank is in an incredibly unique position in a, in a market economy. So they can simply pay the whole amount and that applies to the depositors as well. So if depositors find they're in trouble, they can also say, well, we'll make up your uh, deposits too. So they, they have an infinite capacity to create money for the banking sector, if they wish to, for what they've done. Okay, and that is reserves that, that they're creating. And by the definition, the banks then are able to create deposits, if you will, or, or no. Aug augment. No, 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 no. Okay, help no, me out with that. No, they're, okay, they, they can't create they can't create resources out of reserves, okay? Um, so if reserves go down, deposits go down, okay? People think they're lending from reserves, mean reserves go down and deposits go up. I'm sorry, that breaches every law of accounting. That's not what exactly. actually happens. Uh, but what <laughs> okay, but what they do is if people want their money out of the out of the bank, and it would normally happen if a bank had reserves and had bonds and people were asking for their money out of the account, then as the deposits go down, so the reserves go down. They hit zero reserves. They've got to borrow reserves from somebody else in the banking sector and nobody will touch them in that situation, or they have to sell bonds. Now, if they sell bonds, they've got to realize the loss on the bonds, which currently they're trying to pretend hasn't happened. Okay, so that was the danger. So what they what, what you want to do is top up the reserves. So what the Federal Reserve can say is we're going to top up your reserves and therefore people who come and ask their money out of your account. Yes, you've, because you've got the reserves, you've got the you can cover the deposit exit as well. OK, so banks so have to like have reserves of so sorts. take money out of them. We've created an uh, overdraft. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, very badly well worded. you know you, you, <laughs> very badly what i'm afraid what, what, what did you get it but we'll, we'll, we'll let that one pass okay all right thank you sir all right so let, let's take the final step here and that is if nothing was done if we you know the people that just want to see it crash and burn got their way and you know i i understand the impulse but should the people that just say let it go now with them right if that happened what is the domino effect that we expect to see? Because we're talking about a series of bank runs now. That's what they're that's the way they're laying it out there. That if, yeah. if intervention did not take place, this was going to be a a domino and a series of many dominoes falling that the exact same scenario would play out. What what would what would yeah, the but, catastrophic yeah. results be if they took no action or vice versa? The payment system would the payment system would freeze. You couldn't access your bank account. You couldn't pay for anything. So, like we all rely upon bank accounts for our spending. Uh, if you didn't have that, that's okay. I'll go get my cash stash. I think I've got about forty euro on my cash stash. Okay, so there'd be a dramatic <laughs> drop in people's capacity to spend, and the payment system would collapse. And so, the, this is one of the reasons that people like positive money argue for separating the payment system from the credit system and saying that we should have payments. We should actually use the Federal Reserve as our bank account, and we don't have that danger of a, of a bank run in the case of the Federal Reserve. I'm, I'm not going to say yay or nay on that particular idea. But when we have money in private banks, uh, because most of their assets are bonds or loans, they don't have the cash which we're trying to withdraw. Or if they, if you do try to withdraw from them, the reserves hit zero. And then if you say you want to withdraw from the SVB and put your money in Morgan in your um, uh, Bank of America account instead, then if you've got $250 million in your bank account, and that's the sort of numbers we're talking about for SVB accounts, and the bank itself only has $50 million, then you can take out $50 million, but the other $200 million can't be met. You know, and that being interesting. Goodbye, just, the, the, money, the payment system collapses. I, I just spoke to Raul Carrillo, who is working on the CBDC type stuff right now. And they're talking about direct payments yeah. with the Fed, getting rid of the, 
the private institutions in between us and actually setting up accounts at the Fed. It sounds like this is the kind of thing that's going to push us to that model period anyway. It sounds like it, it, that's it's possible. It's got to be it's possible. That. Yeah. Well, see, okay. this, this again is the fault of the Federal Reserve for letting private debt reach the levels it has and government in general. Neoclassical economists not understanding debt. With, if we hadn't had the level of private debt we've got, we wouldn't have this level of fragility as well. So it all goes back to letting too much private debt get accumulated and fragility coming out of that. For those that don't, under, don't, don't know this sort of stuff, roughly speaking, the level of private debt is twice the level of government debt. And governments, as you and I know, create money. Okay, (laughs) they don't have what we call debt is the the bonds they've issued to back the money they've created. But the private sector has got twice as much debt. People are panicking about, oh, look how high government debt is. Well, government private debt's twice as bloody high. You're complaining about having to climb, you know, Mount Kosciuszko in Australia. We've got a Mount Everest of private debt. That's the real issue here. Yeah, just file bankruptcy. Even after the fund. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. People like to see bankrupt all the universities that teach economic ne- neoclassical economic theory. That'd be the best bankruptcy we could have. Yes, it would be. All right. So, Steve, final word. What do you expect to see from this now that you've w- witnessed your colleagues and other peers writing yeah. about this and your own instincts? Where do you think we go from here? Because this is not just a U.S. phenomenon because the U.S. has got so much no. fingers outside of its borders. I mean, it's yeah. ubiquitous what is the impact what do, you, what do you think we're looking at uh, frankly i think the simplest thing is they're going to increase the amount of money that they insure and deposit the fdrc is going to go up and have no limit on fdrc and frankly that's what it should be the whole idea that it's only you know a quarter of a million is is ridiculous i mean i'd like to have that much money in my bank account obviously i don't <laughs> uh but but it, but if you if you want to maintain a capitalist economy and you're going to have corporations keeping bank accounts they have every reason to understand why a bank a corporation might have a 250 or 500 million dollar bank account i want it all insured i don't want putting money in a bank to be a dangerous act, act. but this is what they've made it into a dangerous act to put money into a bank now that's what all the crypto uh, creatures talk about that's they're salivating over this you know and yeah. in that case there's no need for this to collapse but the federal reserve is doing it best to help out the crypto world without even knowing that it's doing it <laughs> Well, let me ask you this, this comment here from humorous says the SVB is the Silicon Valley bank. It's just going to be another damn bank that the people of America bailed out the people of America. Let's be crystal clear. The people of America are not bailing this bank out. This is the currency issuing government, the, the, the fed, et cetera. The, the current, the, the people are not bailing it out. The, the country is bailing out, but it's not bailing it out. And you've just gone through the process of explaining what happens I mean, but how do we how do we fundamentally shift away from this idea that people are bailing these banks out and start realizing the role of FDIC, the role of the payment system and the role of its ability to absorb loss and be able to move on? Because ultimately, while it, like I, I, this sentiment is shared by so many, this is the kind of comment that yeah. I see all over Twitter. It's not right, but I see yeah. it everywhere. So how do you address it? Because they are convicted. I mean. You can't tell them they're not telling the truth. They believe it 100 yeah. percent through and through. How, how do we, how would you message to well-meaning people that that don't quite get this? Trouble is, it's just like trying to convince people that the Earth ro- rotates around the Sun. Back at the time of Galileo, and all the experts knew that was totally wrong. You know, the Sun, the Earth is the center of the universe, and the Sun rotates around us. And all you got to look up in the sky, see it goes across the sky, east to west. <laughs> that proves that the earth is standing still and the sun is moving. Well, what the hell can you do? And that's 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 the mentality. And the, we're, we're at a similar state, frankly, in our understanding of money right now. People's understanding of money is comparable to the Ptolemaic attitude about the, the structure of the solar system. And, and, and only when the experts themselves say, look, I'm terribly sorry that's wrong, uh, that isn't how banks operate, then the public will ultimately catch up and realise what is actually going on. And anybody who these days says the earth is flat, or um, or the um, that the 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 sun orbits around the earth. We know they're a fool. Okay. Now the trouble is, the people who are supposed to be the experts are themselves fools. The neoclassical Amen. economists. So as long as they dominate, we're going to be stuck with this. We're never going to change it. And this will give us all the, the madness and chaos we get in monetary <laughs> systems and the growth of crypto and so on. So I wish I could see a see a way out of it. But you know, uh, at least we're getting rid of. Uh, 
the Ptolemaic astronomy, Galileo improved <laughs> navigation systems and the calendar didn't shift all the time. Uh, but, you know, it, it was obvious it was a good idea. But we've still got this bunch of, you know, Ptolemaic economists uh, setting the scene. And so long as they dominate, we're never going to get it through the public. Very good. All right, Steve, thank you so much for joining me on short notice. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, folks, go ahead. If you missed the beginning and, re you know, you can watch it from the beginning once I hit end. Uh, this will be able to be shared far and wide. Please make sure you do that. And with that, Steve, I want to thank you once again for uh, joining me. Really appreciate it big time. And uh, you have safe travels and good luck with all the future stuff you've got. And thank you for having me on Steve and Friends, man. Steve Keen and Friends. That was, yeah, it was made fun, my yeah. day. <laughs> it really made my day. It was very nice. So, yeah. Yes. Nice. I'm going to do, yeah, we've got a lot of good people in the, in the, in the heterodox community. So I want to drag them all on over time. And uh, Ty's doing a fabulous job putting that all together. I sit back and just sure enjoy is. it. It's a nice casual he Saturday sure for me. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All okay, right, man. folks. This is Steve and Steve. We're out of here. Have a good one. Yeah. Bye.